Hi, everyone. Welcome to episode 272. It's back. Yes, it's back. The yesterday I went with this. Today I went with some going back to this. And I don't know how I'm going to play it from here on out. It's just going to depend how I wake up and how I feel at the time. I heard nothing but complaints. So uh, I think everybody's okay <laughs> with the Expo tab. I'm, I'm actually shocked that people like to care. No, I, I do see some, a lot of folks for some reason have some hatred some hate for the Expos hat. I don't know why. I, I, who doesn't feel sorry for the Montreal, people of Montreal? Thank you. Just like, like the people of Arizona who care about hockey, all five of them. Uh, yeah, yeah, and like who doesn't feel sorry for people of Oakland and the people of San Diego, which I will say San Diego was my favorite, by far favorite NFL city to go visit, and it's gone now. And I got to go to L.A., like oh, LA, yeah. come on, man. Completely agree. I've been to San Diego like two or three times. I went there with my family on a West Coast summer vacation three years ago, and we we're there half an hour. And my wife was like, Oh, I want to move here. Love San Diego. Yes. Love San Diego. One we're of gonna the most underrated cities oh, in yeah. the United States. If you That's if you are if thinking of taking your family on a vacation anywhere in the United States, San Diego would be my number one selection if you don't like Miami life. Two things very obvious. One's completely obvious, Balboa Park. The other one that's was insanely cool. They ran these little mini cars where you're almost, I mean, you're barely off the ground and you're driving in traffic through the streets of San Diego. It was, it was completely awesome. It, they also have it in San Francisco. The name escapes me what it's called. Somebody in the comments can put it there, but it is so cool. Um uh, Okay, let's talk to some Dolphins here. We're going to discuss – we have two players talk to the media via Zoom on Tuesday, which is week two of the offseason program. Braxton Barrios and Tahir Tart will dive into what each had to say, and both had some interesting things to say. Uh, we, we'll talk, talk some draft. Well, first we'll start with the ever-popular, not for everybody, history lesson, and it deals with number 72. Omar, I know you'll like this one. The one time the Dolphins have picked number 272, which is the exact number of the episode, twice. I had never heard of the two names. I had to look them up. They picked 72 once, defensive end, in 2012 from the University of Miami, picked in the third round. Olivier Vernon. Olivier Vernon. Yes, Olivier Good Vernon team. was on my man crush list. Mm -hmm. um, big fan of that young man. Um, he actually married a Marley. Did you know that? Yes, we we've discussed we've discussed it. It was mentioned in an earlier episode. Yes. Um, so he's in the Marley family now. Uh, great guy, hard worker. Um, probably one of the first and early examples of the Dolphins waiting to do a deal too late, which you have seen many of these examples lately. Um, Dolphins used the transition tag on Olivier Vernon, or was it the franchise tag? I believe it was a transition tag. Transition tag. Uh, agent David Canner, who everybody should know in this market because David's a very popular and powerful agent in the NFL community, um, it, it, it told the Dolphins, we're going to get way more than you're offering. We're taking it to the market. They did take it to the market, got a nice pace-setting deal from the New York Giants. Um, and Miami eventually dropped dropped the transition tag because yes, um, and say la vie. Olivier went on, had productive seasons with the Giants, had productive seasons with the Browns, and then basically decided he'd had enough and stopped playing. And well, he tore an Achilles late late in his last season, and never never was able to still, come back. still could have come back. Well, he, he never did come back from that though. Yeah, I mean. Some guys just choose not to do it. And once you start, this is the thing that I've realized just getting to know the aged veterans. Once you start, once you pass eight, it's got to be worth your while for you to continue to play because not everybody's playing for the love of the game. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that that's uh, Calais Campbell is one, another guy that I, I continue to bring up on this show because it makes absolutely no sense if the Miami Dolphins do not sign him. Um, but Calais ain't playing for less than six million dollars because I'm sorry, you put a price point of everything that you keep in mind. He plays a position that's a car crash every Sunday mm -hmm. for you to put your body through that. There's a dollar value. 
And a lot of guys that people just think that, oh, well, the league pushed them out. No, they still had opportunities to play. They just chose not to play for what teams were offering them. So. Yeah, and then and some guys find no market at some point. It's, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then the league oh. shuts the door on them. Yes. Okay. Uh, and this, this is another, the, the final the postscript to the Olivia Vernon story is that the Dolphins, once they decided, part of the reason they decided also is they didn't want to pay him the amount of money he was going to get. Number two, they said, oh, we have a fallback option. Do you remember where the fallback option was in 2016? Carl Harris. No, it was a former first overall pick in the NFL. It was Mario Williams. They brought him in. Oh, my God. Yep, yes. Had a cup of coffee. It did not work at oh. all. Uh, but yet it was the year the Dolphins returned to the playoffs after an eight-year absence in Adam Gase's first season as head coach. Mario Williams was extremely mediocre. That's being very polite. Let's just say, yeah. And let's just say maybe maybe there were possible questions about the motor running really, really revving high uh, at that stage of, of his career. So it didn't work out. So okay. some guys are not meant for Miami and some guy and, and guys have, uh, I remember Bryce Brown was talking about that. He, he, he was on a podcast. Remember former uh, Dallas receiver, Bryce Brown, who came here for a cup of coffee. No, but Bryce, I remember Butler, Bryce, Bryce Butler. Butler, Bryce Butler, my bad. Bryce Butler. We're number and 14. He basically, he basically said this was, this was during addressing the Fangio comments. And he said, if my career started in Miami, I wouldn't have a career. It's funny. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think you remember correctly, his career ended in Miami. because he. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we're talking about Vernon, a former University of Miami player. We'll switch to another former University of Miami player, that being Braxton Berrios. Oh. Come on. That's all about the U. Uh, who spoke today. He was the first of the two players to go. And the main topic of conversation with Berrios was the new NFL kickoff rule which puts him in play and will give him a lot more opportunities. And not surprisingly, this is something he's looking forward to. Why, why, why are you laughing? Are you sure it's going to give him opportunities? Because uh, yeah, this could be potentially a, a big, big play. And you might want to put Waddle and Tyreek out there. I'm just saying. Or, oh, for, or the, for, that, for that reason. Okay. Um, or yeah. or AJ. Like I, somebody put a, put a tweet under the story and was like, uh, somebody should try to want to tell him, like, you might not be having that job. And I don't disagree with them. Except here's the thing. If you look, if you know, look at the rules, the, the kickers at the 50, the kicking teams at the opponents, 40, the receiving team between the 30 and the 35, it's one like or two returners in the landing zone between, which is between the goal and the 20, the ball has to land there or land there if it's not caught. Otherwise, if it's short, it, the ball's at the 40 for the offense. If it goes in the end zone, the ball's at the 30-yard 30, 30 line. Um, but since there's gonna there's a there's a pretty small gap between defenders, the coverage team, and the return team, guys are gonna get on the returner pretty quickly. So I think the emphasis would be more on quickness than maybe it would be on speed. Long speed. Unless obviously you break through the first line of defense, then you want the long speed. Uh, I mean, and here's the thing: he brought it up. He's like, everybody's just guessing at this point. Sure. Well, okay. guessing in the sense of what what it's going to look like, but you figure, first of all, you don't. Teams are not. Or maybe teams will try to pooch it to land right at the edge of the twenty yard line, to where there's little time for the returner to gain any momentum except a little space to give me the momentum, I should say, except if you come up short and the ball lands, boom, you do give the team the ball to 40, which, which you don't want. Um, and this is the conversation we had before. Do you want to expose HN, Hiller, Waddle, returning kickoffs when their durability is a topic? Well, I'll say it's a I do if this is going to be four or five opportunities per game that I have to deliver a big play, and that's what this is all about. That's what these changes are all about. I mean, you act like you're going to have four or five opportunities. I mean, in, a, in an entire game, you might have 10 opportunities to deliver a big play, and if you give me four kickoffs where I'm going to have the opportunity to have a big play, I'm taking it. 
I'm putting my best out there. I, this is just me thinking out loud here. Now, I've heard people say that it's going to change who the players are on the field in terms of body types. Um, I'm hearing people say that, you know, people are just guessing about what they're going to do. And even Braxton Bears brought it up. He's like, he doesn't expect anybody to be doing their real stuff in the exhibition season. Everybody's going to keep it rather basic till they get to the regular season. Yeah. And this is going to be a new era of special teams play. Now, unfortunately for me, because he brought it up, uh, one of the reporters asked if, if he'd been watching XFL, USFL games to sort of scout it out. And he said, yeah, they looked at some things. I have never watched an XFL game or USFL game. So I don't know what it's going to potentially look like or what teams are doing. But this sounds like a situation where the entire NFL is going to make it up as they go. Well, yeah, there'll be tweaks and adjustments because, again, that's what teams do and nobody shows anything in the preseason. I've watched a couple of not full games, no, but I've seen a couple of kickoffs just because it intrigued me. Um, and it's not as wide, o as wide open as you think. I mean, the guys, the, the coverage team is on top of the returner pretty quickly. Uh, so, I don't know. We'll, we'll see how it plays out. Uh, it, it, again, I'm a little, and, and I get the argument. It's, and again, it's striking a balance, getting your explosive guys on the field with chances to make plays. You just want to put out the expendable guys? Is that what you're calling Braxton Barrett? Guys, good. And, and well, the thing is, and, and I'm the, I'm one of the first ones who was bitching about the lack of big play threat there in the return game last year. Only fair to point out that Braxton Barrios was the all pro returner in 2021 with the Jets, and he led the NFL in kickoff return average that year. So, okay. Player we number two, see. we shall see. Player number two who spoke was Tayer Tart, who is like John U. Smith, a fellow. FIU alum of mine. I went to FIU. So now I got two guys on the team, although I went maybe a tad earlier than they did, but I'm not sure. I'd have to you check. Mean, but... Were you the, were you the Golden Panthers then? Yes. No, no, no. It was the Sun Blazers. See, look at that. Yeah, yeah, I, don't yeah. know if, I don't know if they'll call you as teammates, the, uh, alum, fellow alum. You're, you're not a not. Golden Panther. I have a cap that's got the FIU, it just says FIU, and, and but it's got the tiger running through it, so it doesn't work. Um, Big topic of conversation, and you brought it up yourself with Tyre, was his departure from the Tennessee Titans, and what did you make of his answer? And feel free to elaborate on what he said. Yeah. Um, generally, that was my focus primarily because I, I, I've i covered the NFL for – I don't even know how many years I've covered the NFL. You probably know better than I do. Uh, I think I'm on, on 18 or 16 or – I don't know. It's year 18. It's year 18. Um. I do count the year I did I am athlete off. So um, here's my thing. Just working with I am athlete, I know that a lot of times perception is not reality, um, especially when it's teams putting out the narrative and the narrative to basically try to destroy a player's reputation. I've, I've seen that and dealt with that a ton of times. And just like in real life, there's truth. It's somewhere in the middle. It's not black or white. It oftentimes is gray. And Tier Tart basically was, wasn't getting his contract from the Tennessee Titans, felt like they were doing him dirty, and he wanted his release. And basically, he acted a booty cheek to get his release, um, which is sometimes what you got to do when you, when, you, when you want to get out of a contract. Um, <laughs> yeah. I've been on the other side of that where somebody, <laughs> I, the boss say, acted man. like a booty cheek yeah, trying to get you to quit. Was. So that they wouldn't have to honor your contract. So, hey man, it's it's all it's all fair and game. <laughs> you know, call, I remember one time I got called to a meeting at eleven o'clock at night. Like, are you being serious? Like, like I'm in bed with my family getting called to a meeting. But you mm -hmm. know what? Crazy people do crazy things. Um, but anyway, enough about me. Go ahead. <laughs> Um, yeah, so, and he basically said that I need a change of scenery. I wanted to get out there. I did what I needed to do to get out of there. Um, now, unfortunately, it kind of tarnished his reputation on these free agent streets. 
um, and forced him to sign a deal that basically is a one-year deal that pays him $1.3 million. Um, just a little under $600,000 of that is guaranteed. It's in the neighborhood of all the deals that they signed to these seven defensive tackles that they've added who God knows. Uh, how many defensive tackles do you think they could keep? They're going to keep. No, we, we've, we've discussed that. At, at four or five at, at yeah. the most, probably. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, they've got seven. And a lot of people think that they're potentially going to draft one early, uh, including me and you, which we both selected one early. Because um, we weren't allowed to trade down. That is true. We would like to trade down. Um, yeah. Or we would like to trade up to get an uh, offensive guard, offensive tackle who could play offensive guard. That's not everybody, but well, I do. I do. Not no, up. you're not, uh, not a trade up. Not trading up. No, hold on. Let me, but let, we need to set the stage here. The word out of Tennessee, and this came out of an ESPN story, was that uh, the Titans were not happy with Tart because of attitude questions and lack of effort, which were related to lack of playing time and there's a big nasty circle with Tart in a contract year. And the word the word he used, I need a change of culture. And he was released in December. December now, 15th. Which is now the, the question that we did not ask him that we probably should have asked, and I I mean he may not have been willing to share is when exactly did you first make the request to get out of Dodge? Because if you're doing in December because your team's going nowhere um, I don't know if it, dude. Do you think it says a ton for competitive spirit? Like you know, the ship's sinking. My contract's up anyway, so see ya. No, you have no issue with that. You have no issue with that. Okay. You, you don't want to pay me. Let me go someplace and make an impression with people who do want to pay me. Like, I, I, and I, I, I've been here with many a dolphin player who felt like they were doing time with the organization. So. And could not yep. get out because they had a contract, and contracts are only honored one way in the NFL. But if even if you're feeling you're doing time, not sure half-assing it is the way to go to get what you want. Personally, that's but half-assing it is a great way to get released, which is what you want. But I understand the points that you're making, and I address that in my story. Um, which you can read at si.com slash NFL slash Dolphins. Look at that. Ah! Made, made it easy for you. And, and I, I will say this. Uh, I think of all the bargain signings that the Dolphins made in the offseason. I'm not counting Jordan Brooks. I'm not counting Aaron Brewer. I'm not counting Kendall Fuller, who got like decent, solid money. Like of all the bargain guys, to me, Tart clearly has the highest upside. I, I talked to an NFL well. executive who said he is the best of the defensive tackles that they signed. So okay. now no, I agree. And, if, you, if you look at his tackles, sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. If you look at his tackles for loss ratio per snap last year. I mean, it's up there. It was really, really good. Um, so one would one would think he's back home. He's you know he went to FIU. Uh, he's actually from Philly, the Philly area. Um, one would think he would ball out because he's again in a contract year and the Dolphins are going to get the best of him. So this could turn out to be a very good under-the-radar signing. You know what I love about this whole defensive tackle scenario? Everybody gets a clean slate, um, including Deshaun Hand because Anthony Weaver's new. Um, this is a new scheme. We, we don't even know what it's going to require from the defensive line standpoint, not yet. Um, and also, on top of that, think about Zach Sealer. Zach Sealer is a former seventh-round pick who got waived, got claimed, joined the Dolphins, impressed, earned more playing time, earned a starting role, earned a, a contract extension, and then earned a second contract extension. Um, Zach Sealer is the ultimate success story for the Miami Dolphins organization. And – he could be inspiring a lot of these Jonathan Harris and Benito Jones, who was here during on the practice squad, and Davion Nixon. Nobody knows which one of these guys are going to be that guy or that dude. So it, it, best of luck to them, and we'll see how it plays out. No, I completely agree. Um, and here's here's one more thing about 
this Dolphins defensive scheme and for folks watching, we don't know what it's going to look like. No Chris Greer, what Anthony Weaver and, and everybody's asked, everybody has asked whether it's Anthony Weaver when he did his introductory press conference. Oh, we're going to be multiple to a lot of different things. Okay. McDaniel says nothing. Mike McDaniel, Chris Greer uh, is going to have a lot of the Baltimore elements, but throwing a lot of his things as well. That doesn't tell us anything. Every player like Tartra today was like exactly did they did the Dolphins kind of present you a vision for your role, yeah. what you'll be asked to do and how they run. Nah, I'll leave that to the coaches and all that. And that's all we're gonna get. And it's basically training camp's probably not gonna tell us very much either. Preseason, they might go very, very vanilla. It might not be until the regular season. About, well, I think they'll show us plenty in training camp because they'll be working on things that they won't show the world. So we'll see. We'll know. I think it's a 3-4 base. I think it's got a lot of elements of what the Ravens did, physical to the front line. Remember, this is a guy that played with, with Ray Lewis. Um, I think that they will, based on what he's saying, they'll probably play a lot of zone coverage based on what his preferences were in his introductory press conference. And I also think we'll see a lot of three safety use. Now, the problem with that is you only really have three safeties, and one of them is a special teamer. No offense. Unless, unless this, this maybe ties into unless again, Kyle Hamilton was a safety, but kind of a do everything defensive back for the Baltimore Ravens. Jalen Ramsey kind of, kind of, sort of got the. You're skill. not taking him off the boundary. You're not. Uh, you're moving him around, but the you're Rams, not taking him. The Rams off. did. The He's Rams a Hall of did Fame cornerback. I don't care. The the, the Rams kind of did quite a bit. He's a Hall of Fame cornerback. And he's also no. He's a Hall of Fame defensive back. He's a Hall and of Fame cornerback. Again, if you're looking to mimic or try to duplicate what Baltimore has done, who's that piece who can do the Kyle Hamilton role, which is basically a do a whole lot of everything? Justin hey, Simmons. Not. I'm not taking uh, a Hall of Fame caliber cornerback. And making him a jack do it all safety defensive back. Like, no, that's dumb. Quarterback is a way more important position. Uh, dumb. Who was it? Charles Woodson ended his career as a safety. And Bro, he ended his career when he could barely move and started playing safety. Are you saying Jalen? Whoa, 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 can bear, whoa. Simmer down with it can could barely move. He wasn't as fast as he as he once had been. Okay. I'm just okay, I'm just saying he lost a step and moved to safety. Take take the idea under advisement. Okay, I'm just. You have been obsessed with Jalen Ramsey playing safety for two years now. He, Vic Fangio put you in your place once, and Anthony Anthony Weaver was going to put you in your place again. Like this, it's not happening. I know he's big, but he's not a safety. He's a cornerback. Way more important position. Way more important. You do realize that, right? That's what I said. Sure. <laughs> Except if you again. If you have a guy who has the, the ability to do that, you stick him at corner, then the opposing team avoids him. Okay, or you stick him at corner and have him defend the primary number one target of the opposing quarterback and make the quarterback play left-handed the entire game. Much better strategy, which Vic Fangio refused to do. Okay, fair. Or, or you could just move him around and not allow the defense to know what he's doing per get on any given snap, which is a lot more complicated and it puts pressure on everybody else on the field. And I'm not sure they can handle that on select uh, or maybe everything but select snaps, third downs, red zone, which is basically what they were begging Vic Fangio to do all last season, which he refused to do, which is why part of the reason he's not or or it could be that Anthony Weaver said, yeah, it would be great to have somebody who could do Kyle Hamilton stuff for this defense, but I don't have anybody on this defense who can duplicate that. It, I'm hey. just I'm just throwing things out there as possibilities. They could get one in this draft. I'm just saying. Sure. Uh, there was a recent mock today. I'm trying Ron to remember. Holland could do Kyle Hamilton things, can't he? Yeah, that's, he that's, a good, that's a good question. I, Doesn't I don't he know. want Kyle Adam, Hamilton money? Well, no, he wants Cal. Well, no, Cal Hamilton's son is rookie con. Yeah, but we know. Well, no, he's going to get big money. Um, oh, who was it who put out a, a mock draft today and, and had Nate Wiggins, cornerback from Clemson, 
mock to the Dolphins at 21. I could see it. And then, okay, and then you do you do well with Kendall Fuller, play Kendall Fuller in the slot. Is Nate mm-hmm. Wiggins a slot? I don't believe he's a slot. Um, is it one of those where you pick in for this year, for next year? I, I don't know. I mean, you did that with Cam Smith. He sat all year. I don't, I don't know. I, I, I don't know. Maybe Cam Smith becomes a Kyle Hamilton. Maybe. Who's, who's to say? No. Who's to, my whole point is I, I don't know that we're going to get a really good idea because, okay, sh- yeah, they're going to work on it. I, I'll take it back. I'll, tr- I'll, I'll walk back. You got me on this one. They will show some things during training camp, but they certainly will not show all of it. They will yeah. not show all of it. You can't go all those practices without without addressing it. So um, some of it. Okay. Did a story for this site you see there, si.com slash NFL slash dolphins um, on the SI network, fan nation network, which dealt with this idea of as Omar and I were talking about our mock drafts of trading down. And did you know, Omar, that over the past 16 drafts, the number one pick, sorry, the number 21 pick was traded down six times. Past six 16 times. drafts. What, what's the bounty of what you got for those picks? Well, this is people, you look at look at that. I'm not giving everything away. I just gave you the number of times it's happened to suggest that's 37.5% to suggest, yes, there's a realistic possibility of Dolphin. I want to read that story right now. I'm not even sure I'm going to finish this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's a good one. There you go. And uh, I also wrote about Matt Ryan's retirement today on the site. Why? Well, because Matt Ryan's draft year was involved the Dolphins because the Dolphins had the first overall pick that year, which was 2008, had a decision to make. Do we go with the potential franchise quarterback or do we go with the surefire thing at left tackle who was Jake Long and Bill Parcells, a new man in charge who loves him some – physicality and power when with Jake Long. Omar I'm not even Jake. paying you any attention because I'm actually reading this story. Uh, <laughs> oh, Omar, that was your second year on the beat. I don't know when you came on the beat in 2007. I, I, I remember. I, I, I honestly wasn't listening because I'm reading the story. This is very good. I, I you, you slid this one under the radar on me. Um, so basically, um, I'm not sure. After I'm reading all that, I'm not sure you, – you definitely got to read it at SI.com, NFL Dolphins. I'm not going to give it away, Thank you. but I looked at those six trades, and I walked away saying to myself, I'm not interested in moving down seven picks for, for that. Like, no, I don't know. I don't know, if, I don't know if that will make me happy. I mean, I'm, it's a different caliber player that I'm going to be – and ending up with, and while I might get two additional players on my team, maybe they're two lower tier players, and they're just basically bodies or special teamers or eventual starters. Whereas I'm going from the prospects of getting a legit first round pick to now getting a legit top 50 talent and then two extra players. I'm I, I'm 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 kind of uh, turned off right now. <laughs> I didn't mean to turn you off. Uh, there was a song called "I Didn't Mean to Turn You On." This one, yeah, really listen, definitely read that story because Ellen Papard has just ruined my day with it. So yes, there you go. Yeah. Is by the way, it was a, for those who are going to throw out and Mr. Negatives at it again. This was purely historical statistical data presenting what Dolphins could get for number twenty-one. Don't jump at me. Okay, so I was saying now. Can now do I have your attention? And that's based on history. That's not even that's Correct. like that's based on history. And Correct. then when history. you look at the players that people selected, stay where I'm at. Okay, let's go back to the other point. Pay attention now. I was talking about the 2008 All draft, right. which was shortly after you joined the beat in 2007. Dolphins had the first overall pick. Yep. They had their choice of any player in the draft could have taken the potential franchise quarterback and Matt Ryan from BC. They chose to go with physicality power because that's what Bill Parcells loved. So he took Jake Long from Michigan, who was seen as a can't miss prospect. And he wasn't missing until his knees started becoming problematic. So how do you look back at that decision? 
technically nobody can be a camp miss prospect because the, we never know how players going to hold up medically. Okay. Number one, um, Jake long was the safe bet. And I always say this when we re recall history, you need to recall that the dolphins plan was to go Jake long and Joe Flacco. If that had worked out, I think history would record this selection a, a, a lot differently because Joe Flacco had a very admirable career. Um, I would argue to at one point he was better than Matt Ryan. However, however, if you think about where this franchise would be with Matt Ryan being a stabilizing presence for this franchise for at least 12 years, they would have been much better, much healthier. I mean, we've basically spent the last two decades in Siberia because we hadn't didn't have co good quarterback play. And we finally get to the point where we have a Matt Ryan S quarterback and everybody's talking about Super Bowl. So, and I would argue with anybody who's not willing to say that Tua Tungvalu is a Matt Ryan S quarterback because he is. Um, so maybe we would be ahead in this franchise because we wouldn't have wasted time with Ryan Tannehill. We would have put better talent around the player. So I, I might I might say that, you know, I don't think, but I don't think the Dolphins would have won a Super Bowl. So we probably would have had better sustainable success, but never have won a Super Bowl. Yeah, and, and that's the thing. And with, my, with Ryan's career ending, it's like uh, I saw a tweet from the pro football hall of fame like looking okay let's talk about this in five years and i'm thinking is matt ryan really a hall of fame player i mean he's he not. was good mvp in 2016 when the falcons went to the super bowl uh with a coaching staff that included mike mcdaniel by the way yeah that was his one shining year it made the pro bowl four times in 15 years but still number one yeah no that's he's not a pro bowler he's not that we made he, he had one great season one great season with Mike McDaniel on that staff. Yep. All right. Uh, I mean, he did make the Pro Bowl four times, uh, but 2016 okay. is the only time he got he got Offensive Player of the Year votes, and he actually was the MVP. Um, but the bottom line is, I concluded in the story. You should still read it regardless, but that if you considering positional value. And the other part of it is the Dolphins thought they'd be okay with Chad Henney as a as quarterback. That didn't. That was out. a settlement. Well, yeah, they would they settle for when once Flacco was gone, um, but then considering the positional value of quarterback versus left tackle, because uh, I will say Jake Long was a better left tackle than Mac Ryan was a quarterback every day of the week. Yeah, um, but one lasted fifteen years. One lasted six. Played seven, but last. Seven. Seven or eight, but the last three were like all injury riddled. So, um, and that, and also another point I made that's that's nowhere near the biggest. If you want, to, if we we're going to call it a draft blunder, it was nowhere near the biggest draft blunder. You chimed in on Twitter with John Avery over Randy Moss, even though I keep telling you the Dolphins never had the opportunity to read, to draft Randy Moss because they they no longer had. They no longer I, have their I pick. Care. Every time I think about Randy Moss possibly becoming a Dolphin, I think all Dolphin fans do. Go no, and we had, I had a couple of good submissions because the two the two I put in there was Drew Brees. Sorry, was Jamar Fletcher over Drew Brees and Eddie Moore over Anquan Bolden. And then somebody chimed in, a couple of people chimed in with Charles Harris over TJ Watt, which certainly is a very good one. Um, what's the other one I saw? Oh, somebody Here. put Deion Jordan over everybody. Uh, I will say this in defense of John Jordan, that 2013 draft, not a bad draft. Bad draft. Bad, yeah. bad draft. Bad draft. Um, I, I, uh, the, the, um, the Ronnie Brown over Aaron Rodgers. I, I don't think that should be overlooked as well. So, except Ronnie yeah. was a good player, but you you passed up a Hall of Fame quarterback. And here's the thing. Had Aaron Rodgers played at an SEC school, chances are Nick Saban would have taken him. But he was like – it was basically the draft was like, okay, where are my SEC guys? SEC guys. Okay, Ronnie Brown, that's it. Um, but, yeah, no. That yeah, could have had Cadillac Williams. You went Ronnie Brown. Same school, right? 
Yeah. And Cedric Benson also was a uh, top five running back, three running backs. And I had seen they used to have this college football all star skills competition at Hard Rock Stadium. It. Yep. And I covered that one in 2005 with a young Aaron Rodgers. Talked to him after the event. And it was like, there was like standoffishness, kind of arrogance about him. It's interesting. Hmm. Oh yeah, even even that, back. That then, might be why he slid to twenty something in the draft. Twenty three. That 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 standoffish and personality, and you know how they bet these quarterbacks, and they find out how quirky they are, and how left field they are, and you know what, what their dating life is, and do they whore around? The quarterbacks that are whores always drop because if you're chasing skirts, you can't be focused on quarterbacking. I got that straight from the NFL executive. Like okay. they want, they want their quarterbacks married. Not that that changes things, but yes, okay. it should. It should. Well, the focus is on football. I guess would be the. Yeah. I, I remember not to segue, but I remember there are a lot of Dolphins players who began the league, who began their careers married. And then when they were drafted and then, Oh, something changed. Mm -hmm. Take your time, fellas. Take your time. <laughs> uh, on that note. <laughs> uh, are you going to segue to Tua now? Let oh, we want to talk about Tua? Um, Your call. Nah, yeah. No, I'm going to tease. I'm going to do a little tease here. Check out si.com slash NFL slash Dolphins. We have a story on Tua comments talking about his draft experience of 2020, which is actually interesting now in retrospect. And I will leave it at that. All righty. Well, this is the All Dolphins podcast. Uh, we will be back later on. Draft is on Thursday night. Obviously, we'll do a podcast before the draft, after the draft. Um, I'm going to be hosting the Joe Rose Show on Thursday. So for all the QAM fans and listeners, check me out there. And we will be back tomorrow.